welcome to Cardia, your school for hearts and sciences. I'm Mark McDonald. And our Dean of the School of Hearts and Sciences, Dr. Greg Mishkel, is with us today. And Dr. Mishkel, you're also the Executive Medical Director of the Prairie Heart Institute at St. John's Hospital. Um, worked with us on a number of programs and helped bring us some of your capable colleagues to come in and talk with us as well. Absolutely. It's, it's, uh, it's one of my great joys in life that I get to work with and uh, lead a, a talented group of surgeons and cardiologists and anesthesiologists and uh, we have one of the most talented, believe it or not, Jeff Goldstein here today with us and we're going to talk about peripheral arterial disease, peripheral vascular disease. A lot, it's a field that a lot of people don't, wouldn't think, well what are cardiologists doing messing around in the rest of the body? You know, they always think of, well it's the heart, it's the heart, the heart, but it's not. Wherever there's an artery that's affected by or feeds the heart, that can also have uh, problems just like heart coronary arteries, can't they? Absolutely. It's the same disease process, the same thing we worry about in uh, coronary artery disease, uh, specifically atherosclerosis. The buildup of plaque, which can uh, obstruct blood flow, is a global process. What I mean is it occurs in all vessels in our body. And, um, you know, many of the innovations that were really uh, spearheaded by cardiologists, meaning stents and minimally invasive procedures have now been applied to vessels all over the body. So it's, it's not unusual that uh, cardiologists are taking care of all forms of vascular mm -hmm. disease. Do they still call it hardening of the arteries? Is yes. It, it, and they'll call it that wherever it occurs, huh? Absolutely. In fact, uh, o over time you'll even develop bony growth within in blood vessels like calcium. It's as hard as a rock in, in many instances. Mm -hmm. Um, and this can occur, like we said, it can occur in your, in your legs, in your neck. Uh, in, a in the case of first clip we're going to see, it can occur in your gut. Absolutely. And really from uh, head to toe. Yeah, let's, let's take a look at that clip because this is a recent procedure at, at St. John's. Um, this, I, I believe that you, you all know better than I do, this is a stent that's going to go in which, which artery, uh, Greg? Well, this, in this particular case, which I think uh, our partner Dr. Kashwami is doing, is a, a patient who has pain uh, uh, upon eating. Uh, because one of the arteries to her gut, the celiac artery, is narrowed. And, and this is the uh, weapon of choice, or at least in this case. And Jeff, do you want to describe what we're looking at there? Well, what you see there is the, the stent, and the stent is crimped at first uh, on uh, a balloon. So that stent on that balloon, on that catheter, can be uh, fed over a wire. So the first part of the procedure, the wire is advanced across the blockage or the lesion. And then just like a train travels on a track, that balloon and stent will travel over that wire to wherever it's needed. Uh, what we're seeing here is the balloon being inflated, and what this does, it not only dilates that blockage or expands that blockage, but it's expanding the stent. And the stent will stay in an open configuration, like a scaffold. It'll hold that blockage open, it'll hold that blood vessel open. Uh, so once the balloon is deflated, that we'll see here momentarily, the balloon and the catheter can be removed and the stent mm -hmm. will stay in place holding that vessel open. Mm -hmm. and, and a stent will stay, will keep a vessel open for what, an indefinite period of time or is it, does it have a lifespan? Well, it's different for different vessels, but the stent stays in forever. And uh, it's interesting, but different vessels in different locations have different re-stenotic characteristics, if you will, meaning the chance that it'll re-narrow is different for different vessels. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, uh, you know, in general, they do a very good job of staying open T for a long time. Typically, the larger the vessel, the less chance that it will renarrow mm -hmm. over time. And you know, every procedure has its pluses and its minuses. Stents have pluses and minuses, particularly in big vessels. Surgery might have pluses and minuses <coughs> in, in other circumstances. A and to be fair, this technology is utilized now not only by cardiologists but by vascular surgeons and interventional mm -hmm. radiologists. Jeff, now that's a different look, right? What, what's that, Jeff? So this is really fascinating technology, but what this is called is uh, intravascular ultrasound. So what we're actually getting here is a view from inside the vessel. <coughs> so Dr. Goswami is using a catheter with an ultrasound probe, a tiny ultrasound probe advanced inside the blood vessel. And am I imagining it, but am I seeing blood? You are seeing blood. <laughs> the red, it's not red because blood is red, but the computer uh, uses that motion mm -hmm. and, uh, and plays it as red. Uh, pulsating inside okay, that vessel. Okay, so we were looking, we were looking down through an artery, sort of down like as barrel. you're looking right down the barrel, right downstream. Yep. Right. And where you saw that circle, that's a good sign, huh? Well, that as was a stent, were, wide open. As if you were standing in the middle of that stent and looking around at the walls, mm -hmm. and then and actually seeing what's going on. Okay, and so if it were not, if it were blocked, if it weren't wide open, 
it would have been much you, narrower. Correct. You'd see the stent kind of folded on itself. Mm -hmm. And that pulsatile red flow would be much narrower. So that, that flow, that red you were seeing, was filling the entire lumen or the blood vessel. Mm -hmm. so now, in a case like this, this elderly woman is, has pain. She has trouble eating and digesting. She, she, she can't eat because she knows every time she eats, she's going to be in pain. Right. Right. So how, did, how do you diagnose in a case like that which vessel you need to target? Well, there's, there's three blood vessels that really supply the gut, that supply the bowels. And, you know, conventional thinking is that you need at least two of those to be severely narrowed um, or completely blocked to cause symptoms. But a lot of these patients will come in with this abdominal discomfort, as you described it, a fear of eating because they know it's going to hurt, and uh, really dramatic weight loss. Mm -hmm. So with those constellation of symptoms, we go looking for uh, a narrowing in the appropriate vessel. So a lot of times it's an ultrasound or other imaging techniques such as a CT mm -hmm. or an MRI will reveal mm -hmm. the narrowing. Once, once we've got a high suspicion based on those studies, then we do an angiogram, uh, kind of like what Dr. Goswami was doing. At the time of the angiogram, if the narrowing is confirmed, we can fix it. Mm -hmm. Let, let's say you're a GP, you know, right. uh, and, and your patient comes to you with, with, with stomach ache. You're not going to send them to a cardiologist, are you? No, and, and t well, uh, typically these patients have seen many doctors before they end up with the doctor who ultimately makes the diagnosis, and it may not be a cardiologist who makes the diagnosis, it might be a vascular surgeon, mm -hmm. it might be an internist, but the point is oftentimes because the symptoms are relatively nondescript, uh, abdominal pain, uh, nausea, maybe some weight loss, th th these patients oftentimes, have, the most common doctor they've seen is a gastroenterologist, and they've been scoped top and bottom, sideways, uh, mm -hmm. And many times it's been months, if not years, before the diagnosis is finally uh, made. Mm -hmm. Gone through a lot of uh, uncomfortable situations to, to find out that it was just something pretty simple, huh? Uh, yes. Yeah. It, 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 you know, it's not the most common of clinical scenarios. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have to have a pretty high index of suspicion to make the diagnosis right from the get-go. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the next procedure we're going to see is an aortic aneurysm. And uh, uh, I love the way you were able to describe how, where, where it is and how you get to it. You know what I mean? Because as you describe the heart, um, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to visualize from, from, from just from the outside what the difficulty is and where that, where well, that is. Well, Jeff has a particular passion for aneurysm disease. And although I'm doing this procedure, Jeff, Jeff has really spent a, a considerable amount of time uh, helping to build our aneurysm program. This, this patient in particular has a thoracic aneurysm, which is in his chest. The most common version of, uh, of an aneurysm is in the belly. And Jeff, kind of lead us through, because we, we've been talking about blockages. What's the difference between blockages and aneurysms? Yeah, this is, this is different than blockage. This is actually a, uh, a enlargement of a blood vessel. And we're talking about the aorta here. But in general, an aneurysm is defined when a blood vessel has become 150% its normal diameter. So mm -hmm. one and a half times its normal diameter. And there, there, look at that monster of a stent there, and that's what you're talking about, right? Yep, that's a stent graft. And we say mm -hmm. stent graft because you can see that stent is covered with a uh, fabric, a graft material. And the purpose of that in this procedure is really to exclude blood flow or take the pressure off the wall of that aneurysm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so as we were saying, a normal aorta, at least in the abdomen, abdomen is about two centimeters. Mm -hmm. So once it becomes three centimeters, um, it's defined as an aneurysm. Mm -hmm. The bigger the aneurysm gets, the thinner the wall of the vessel is, the more likely it is to rupture. So that's the thing with, with aneurysms. If we don't look for them, we don't find them. Mm -hmm. If we don't find them and a patient has them, and they do rupture, they almost uniformly die from it. Yeah, because you lose all your blood there, don't you? That's where all your blood is going through. It's got about a 90% mortality. Yeah. And the, the, wow. the thing about aneurysms is they're not symptomatic until they rupture, until it's too late. Mm -hmm. So if, if we don't look for them, if we don't find them, people die. Mm -hmm. So this particular individual had an aneurysm not in the usual location, which is in your abdomen, but he had a, an aneurysm in his uh, thoracic aorta. And this is a uh, one of the many commercially available devices, one of the newer commercially available devices that mm -hmm. we were actually getting some instructions on uh, because yeah. it was only the first yeah, or second time we've talked about this earlier in, this, in other episodes of this program. You, you, you might go into a procedure never having 
manually used a particular device before, but you've used so many of them and they're very similar that you can, you can train pretty quick on them, can't you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have to, right? <laughs> I, I, wouldn't say, I wouldn't say we go into procedure never having uh, used a certain device or anything. But yes, a lot of these devices, like Stengraf that we're talking about now, are uh, similar. So the training going from one to another I I is minimal. Mm -hmm. yeah. But but Stengrafs and aneurysms are an, an excellent example of what we were talking about earlier. Taking these minimally invasive techniques and applying them to these uh, disease process that, that used to require very morbid operations. So to fix a thoracic aneurysm is really quite a big deal. It involves a long incision on the back and the side of the chest. Uh, patients are in the hospital for weeks. There's a high incidence of complications and, and even dying from the procedure. Mm -hmm. And now we literally do them in less than an hour and patients go home in a day. That's amazing, and you s just you just slide a sleeve up there, and that's if you get it in the in the right place, well, and that's that's the trick is you want to make sure it lands in the right place because you've got blood vessels going up to the brain in the area of the aneurysm, mm -hmm. and you don't want to put that sleeve across the blood vessels to the brain, otherwise you're going to have the obvious problems. Right, and, and in the case of the man we're talking about now, he came to you after he'd already had a bypass graft in his neck, and then you had to make sure that you didn't cover up the bypass, right? right? So in this particular case, because his aneurysm extended right up to and almost included the arteries to the, to mm -hmm. the brain, we, we had to sort of do some fancy rewiring, if you will, mm -hmm. and, and our surgical let's, partner, let's Dr. Take, Stevens, did that Let's take a look us. at it. Let's take a look at the next clip and see. Uh, and see, now this is you, uh, you're, you're getting ready to do the procedure now, but this is where, you know, we saw you in that last clip where you were, where you were manning that big gun that was gonna deploy that monstrous uh, stent graft, and uh, uh, and you'll you'll get to it again here uh, as soon as they get you twirled right. around and ready to go. In in, in abdominal aneurysms, which are uh, a little less complex, but the, well, they may be actually more complex. But uh, typically, we can actually do those under what we call conscious sedation, local anesthesia. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the patient was actually under general anesthesia, but mm -hmm. it's the same principles. So, Jeff, what's happening here? So right now Greg is getting access in the uh, femoral artery on the left side of this patient. And uh, you know the femoral arteries connect to the iliac arteries mm -hmm. which connect to the aorta. And, and uh, that's where he needs this uh, graft, this stent graft to be. So you saw the needle, you saw the blood, now he's advanced a wire through that needle mm -hmm. into the artery. And what you have is the wire going from outside the patient's body through the mm -hmm. skin into the artery. And now is that another wire? Where the, that, where was the a, that was a catheter. Oh, okay. Kind of think of it as a uh, tube with a little hemostatic valve on the end. So now uh, Dr. Mishkel has access to the patient's uh, arterial circulation. Mm -hmm. He can advance things through the end of that catheter. He can inject dye uh, through the catheter uh, to visualize. And um, he can measure the blood pressure of the patient mm -hmm. continually as we do the procedure. Mm -hmm. So what he's doing here is advancing a wire up further into the patient's body. And uh, over a series of exchanges, he'll, he'll take larger catheters so he can get a catheter big enough that he can uh, advance that device uh, to where it needs to be mm -hmm. in the patient. Mm -hmm. I think uh, what's happening here is that the, the big tube, the giant sleeve, is actually going to go in on that side there. And so what we're, we're doing is we're putting in uh, some sutures that we're going to use to sew up the artery at the end of the procedure. Mm -hmm. Again, all of this can be done without any major uh, cutting. It's a very small hole. You, what we saw you, it was just a, like a pinprick that you, uh, that you well, did. Well, you start off with a pinprick, mm -hmm. and then you progressively enlarge it. So everything starts with that one simple mm -hmm. needle puncture. Now here's... And here comes the, that monstrous... Uh, here's the tool. device. Yeah, yeah And they all look like this. That, that can fit through, right? <laughs> <laughs> it is. And now you're picking out... Those are... That you're, you're choosing... The, each one of those is a little bigger than the other, too. Right. So right? Th those are called dilators. And, mm -hmm. and typically, we would slide these dilators in to progressively enlarge the hole to make room for the ultimate mm -hmm. uh, device. And, and then that will come out, and then you'll put another one in and, and just expand it a little bit each time. Correct. Huh? Okay. And that's all to make way for this... for the big catheter that's right. going to go in. And, uh, you know, this, this particular technique is, is how we treat probably the majority of our aneurysms now, abdominal aneurysms. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I saw a couple in clinic just today. Um, it's really the preferred method. Um, as Greg said, most of the patients for abdominal aneurysms, we treat while they're awake. Um, small holes like this, and the patients stay in the hospital overnight, go home the next day. Oh, that's wonderful.
compare that to a week in the hospital mm -hmm. and several days of nothing to eat. Yeah. Uh, so what you can see here is they're advancing the device, uh, which is on this catheter, mm -hmm. much like the stent we saw in the celiac artery, the first case was on a catheter. This is uh, on a catheter as well, just mm -hmm. on a mm -hmm. bigger scale. And it's going from the groin. Here you see it going through the abdomen, the abdominal aorta. Mm -hmm. It's going to go up into the chest. And you can actually, you spoke about hardening of the arteries. If yeah. you look closely, right where the nose cone is, you can see the dark outline of the blood vessel. That's the calcium Greg was talking mm -hmm. about. That's the hardening of the arteries. That's the, where the, the term comes this from. This patient's, uh, his, his aorta is like bone. It, it has the same density as the spine behind it. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell me, I, I, as I recall, he had, you said he had a, a disease, quite a bit of heart disease in that, in that aorta. His whole right. aorta was diseased, correct. What, what will keep that from just shredding or falling apart? A as we go push things through. You know, yeah. well, um, obviously you want to be gentle. Mm -hmm. Obviously you want to make sure that you're in the right place and uh, not push too hard. But, you know, conceivably you can traumatize vessels from the inside. Mm -hmm. And you're more likely to do it in a case like that where the man already has heart disease and he's, he's, had, he's had difficulties in the past. Well, you're more likely to do it in somebody who has a diseased aorta like that, mm -hmm. for sure. So after you, and we'll get to this, but, but, but let's say you get that sleeve where you want it. Um, he was an elderly man. Is, is, he, is he likely to have difficulty there again or, or is he pretty much going to be good for a while? Well, uh, Jeff, what do you think? Well, the, in the majority of patients with current technology, this treats the aneurysm and we're done. Done that most patients don't need a repeat procedure. Mm -hmm. but, but it's not perfect technology. So what I emphasize to my patients is this is, you're not done completely. You're gonna have to come back and see me at least once a year. We're gonna do a CT scan. And what we're looking for, we wanna make sure that stent graft's in the position we left it in and that there's no leak, right? So if there's blood getting into the aneurysm, that means there's pressure on the wall of the aneurysm and we've done nothing for them. Mm -hmm. if, if we do find a leak with follow-up uh, imaging, then we gotta track it down and we gotta fix it. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's very good, but some pa patients we have to come back and, and touch well, up. Let's look at the next clip and see how Greg did, did on this one because what, we would, what we'll end up with here is some, some pictures of, of the after. Now this is still the, the stent going in and you're trying to find the proper location. Yeah, so you can see the nose cone of the stent. It's mm -hmm. coming over the aortic arch, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So if it were to keep going in the direction it's going, it'd end up at the heart, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's what he wants, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, we want to end short of the heart and we want to land this so that we don't cover any of the vessels to the neck uh, and we want to obviously seal off uh, mm -hmm. the aneurysm. So, so you want that stent graft to start in relatively normal vessel, end in relatively normal vessel. In between is the aneurysm. And you can see kind of the right side of the screen where the vessel gets quite big there. Yeah. That's the aneurysm. Looks like the boa constrictor that okay. swallowed the cow. And, and so what you're going to have to do when you, when, you diff, when you inflate this thing and it opens up, that's, what you want, that's where you want it to be, right? Right well, where that... Well, you want to have normal tissue at the top and normal tissue at the bottom and then have that, that big mm -hmm. sleeve go right through that aneurysm mm -hmm. to exclude blood flow yeah. from it. And, and you'd already measured this prior to that, so you knew which size, which size stent right. graft to right. have. There, there's a lot of uh, imaging that goes on in this. We do what we call a CT angiography with 3D reconstruction, mm -hmm. where we can actually reconstruct uh, the entire aneurysm in three dimensions. And so we have a very good idea of what it is that we're going to be mm -hmm. dealing with. That now the sleeve has opened up in this situation. And you can sort of see the scaffolding. There's another picture. Okay, has it been, have you just deployed it? Right, and it, everything is opened up and it's uh, across that aneurysm. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you can see the screen, the mesh, you can see the mesh on there. Right. Mm -hmm. And the idea being that over time you're going to redirect blood flow not through the aneurysm but through that giant mm -hmm. sleeve. Mm -hmm. it, it looks like y'all are pretty pleased with that outcome. This was a this was a good day mm -hmm. for him and me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now you're pulling it out after after the stent's been right. left in. You're pulling out the catheter. Right, and everything gets left behind. Mm -hmm. And that was the that was the balloon, I guess, that you were pulling out. The, the big long yeah. catheter that yeah. you saw at the beginning. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. Okay, now these are some pictures that you took afterwards. We looked back, you know, at uh, at what you had done, and what you what you see here, Greg, is you, you can actually see the the arteries that you were talking about that you wanted to avoid covering up. Right. Uh, on the top of the screen there, those two big arteries heading north 
are, are, you don't want to cover those up mm -hmm. because they're going to prime territory. They're going to his brain. And then to the right, as Jeff pointed out, that uh, big outpouching is, the, is this large thoracic aneurysm, which in real life is even probably bigger than that mm. uh, because there's clot within the sac that doesn't show up on this angiogram. Now, I talked about his future a little bit before. Just because he has a sleeve in this aneurysm doesn't mean that the tissue around it isn't somehow deteriorated or deteriorating as he gets older? Is well, that that's a very good point. It's actually interesting. So think of it kind of, um, I like to explain it to my patients. And when I was a kid, we had, all the bikes had inner tubes. You'd get that, sometimes you get that bleb that mm -hmm. would grow and grow and grow. And you knew the bigger it got, the thinner it was getting, mm -hmm. the more you were getting about to get a flat tire. Well, what we've done here is we've taken the pressure off of that aneurysm. So actually, over time, what we'll see, if we're successful a lot of times, is that aneurysm will start to shrink down again. It'll collapse around that stent because we've unloaded it, if, we, if you will. We've taken the pressure off mm -hmm. the walls, and it, it shrinks over time. Uh -huh. We don't want to see it getting bigger. If it's continuing to grow, something, something's not mm -hmm. treated. Mm -hmm. And you can get aneurysms in different blood vessels in the same way as you can get blockages in different blood vessels. You can develop progressively over time aneurysms in different locations down the blood vessel. Mm -hmm. Right. And different aneurysms in different locations have different consequences. Not all of them are we so concerned about rupture. You know, and some of them, uh, for instance, behind the knee, we're more concerned about pieces of blood clot breaking loose and going down to the foot and causing problems there. So th there's problems with embolization in certain locations, and there's problems with rupture mm -hmm. in other locations. I think these are pretty much our last looks at this now, and this is, uh, it's kind of a horseshoe-shaped uh, deal, and you can see where, uh, where it looks like. Looks like you got good blood flow there. Right, and I can tell you that uh, we've done follow-up CT scans on this individual, and uh, his aneurysm sac, as Jeff has uh, alluded to, as the pressure in the sac, mm -hmm. uh, it, it diminishes, that aneurysm just begins to shrink away. Do they feel that? Do, do, I mean, can they feel an aneurysm? No, even, well, even when they're... If it bursts, they feel it. Well, no, but I mean before before. You that, know what? If that, aneurysms get big enough, particularly in the thorax, and they press on other vital structures, uh, for instance, patients could get hoarse from an aneurysm, lose their voice mm -hmm, from an aneurysm. Mm -hmm. But, you, you know, I, I think that's a good point. I'm going to say it again. Uh, you know, the most common place, as Greg mentioned, is the, in the abdomen. If you're a man and you've ever smoked and you're over 65, there's a reasonable chance, 5% chance that you do have an aneurysm and you don't feel it. You don't feel it until it's too late. Mm -hmm. So what we've done, what Greg alluded to at, uh, at Prairie Heart is really set up an aggressive screening program. Because if we miss these patients, and they do have a large aneurysm, five centimeters or bigger, in five years time, there's a 50% chance that patient will be dead. Mm -hmm. So if by we don't look, we don't see them. Mm -hmm. Now by screening program, in fact, this is part of uh, uh, the Medicare program for, for patients over the age of 65. Do you want to just briefly describe that? I mean, th that's how important it is that even the government will agree to pay for it. But mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, if you're, if you're a man, 65 mm -hmm. years or older, and you've ever smoked in your life, as few as 100 cigarettes, mm -hmm then you qualify for a one-time abdominal aortic ultrasound. And, and Medicare will pay for that. There's no copay by the patient, so it's free to the patient. Uh, so all those patients should be screened. If you're a Medicare patient and you're a woman and you have a family history, so mom, dad, brother, sister, mm -hmm. have had an aneurysm, you also qualify for that screening. And, and why they've done that is there was an important study that showed if you took that population of patients and you did one ultrasound screening, mm -hmm you reduce the mortality of that group of patients by 70% over five years' time. Man. So, yeah. uh, it, it makes a difference. Yeah, it sure and, does. And it's a painless study. It takes less than an hour to do. Mm -hmm. We haven't talked about the legs. You know, so many people have leg pain, and, and people, again, don't associate this with a cardiologist, part of, their, part of what a cardiologist does. But you probably see a lot of patients that have that. Uh, I'm not sure what they call that. Is that claudic claudication? Claudication. Yeah, every day we, we see patients uh, with claudication. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. It's, you know, we, it's described in the textbook as, as pain, such as in the calf muscle, that a uh, burning discomfort that happens when you walk, it goes away when you rest. But it's, it's not always so classic. Uh, patients come in with, with different symptoms, uh, sometimes no symptoms. A lot of patients will say, well, you know, my leg just kind of gives out after I walk half block. Mm. Just last week I saw a patient who was all teed up to have his hip replaced because he got buttock and hip pain when he walked. 
Turns out he just had a blockage in his iliac artery and it was the muscles that were hurting. We put a stent in and went home the same day. The pain's gone, oh. he never needed the hip. Huh. So. Yeah, and, and this was, uh, now that the, not the population's getting older, of course, you see all kinds of things, but I would imagine that this, this blockages in the legs is, is common now. It is very common, and I think part of the issue is really asking patients, you know, do you have discomforts when you walk? Unlike a heart attack, which obviously costs somebody their life, uh, oftentimes uh, legs seem to take a lower priority mm -hmm. uh, unless you're having pain. Yeah, well, you don't think, you know, well, it's not gonna kill me, right? Right. But I mean, if you can't get around, It'll kill you sooner or later, right? You got to you got to maintain a certain amount of health in order to be able to. Usually, golfers are the first to uh, complain. Mm -hmm. It's they have a low threshold to complain when they can they can't walk the course mm -hmm. anymore. And then, but how do you detect what uh, how, what kind of test do you do to detect where a blockage might be in well, the legs? The first test we do is just an exam. You know, uh, you said it doesn't kill you, but you know, peripheral arterial disease is kind of like a window to the heart, if you will. What I mean is. A patient comes in to see me and I feel the pulses or I can't feel the pulses in their feet and their legs, well that's a sign of arterial blockage. As we discussed earlier, it's a global process. If they got in their legs, boy I'm going to be looking in their carotid arteries, I'm going to be looking in their heart. Mm -hmm. um, but So the first test is just examining the patient and then the next test, which is almost an extension of our physical exam, is a test called uh, ABIs or ankle brachial indices. And what we do is basically measure the blood pressure in the arm and compare it to the blood pressure in the ankle, right? They should mm -hmm. be the same, mm -hmm. right? But uh, if a patient has a blockage somewhere between their aorta and their feet, there's going to be a pressure gradient, okay? Yeah. So uh, that's an uh, easy way uh, to determine if there's a hemodynamically significant blockage. If it's normal at rest, we exercise them. As the blood flow increases, we can exaggerate that, that gradient mm -hmm. and uh, determine whether it's So a disease. kind of stress test, I guess, in a way. Stress you know, test for the legs. Yep, yeah. Stress test for yeah. legs. Very interesting. And then, of course, when, if that happens to be the case, that can be treated with a stent, just like anywhere else in the body can. Yeah, they, we, uh, they, you know, the first line of therapy is really exercise. A lot of patients can get some relief, yeah. walk further with less discomfort with, with exercise. But yeah, if, if the blockage is not relieved with medicine, exercise, then uh, we can relieve the blockage with a stent. Mm -hmm. and, and one important uh, caveat, which is uh, you know, we, we always talk to our patients about uh, above and beyond all else, particularly when it comes to peripheral arterial disease, when they say what's the leading cause of it, it's smoking, smoking, and, and smoking. smoking. Don't forget smoking. Yeah. <laughs> I, did I say smoking? Yeah. Maybe we should say that one more time. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mischel, Dr. Goldstein, thank you very much. Thank wonderful, wonderful, wonderful information. Thank you for watching Cardia, your school for hearts and sciences. For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.